The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you, everyone. We are here today for five different cases. The first one is State of Iowa versus Daquan Bolden. Second case is Brian Terry and Lisa Terry versus Megan Dorothy. Those two cases will be submitted with oral argument. The next three cases are submitted without oral argument. State of Iowa versus Howard Thompson. State of Iowa versus Irvin Johnson Jr. And State of Iowa versus Christopher Roby. At this time, we will begin with State of Iowa versus Daquan Bolden. Um, I'll the state, I know that you are the appellee, but would you please check your microphone with Justice Apple? Yes, Your Honor, Justice Apple, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Thank you, and I'll ask for a quick sound check by Mary Conroy as well, and then you may begin your argument. Testing, testing. Very good, thank you. May it please the court, counsel. Uh, this afternoon, I'm here representing Daquan Bolton. Uh, Mr. Bolton filed or entered his guilty plea in March of 2019, and he was sentenced on July 1st, 2019. Uh, first, I think this court's decisions in Damian Henderson uh, show that the defendant has met his burden of um, establishing good cause for this appeal. Mr. Bolton only raises sentencing claims. He does not challenge the underlying guilty plea itself. Uh, it was a discretionary sentence and it was not agreed to as part of the agreement. He raises two major claims today. Uh, one is the breach of the plea agreement and then the second is a consideration of an improper factor. Uh, in this case, there was a breach of the plea agreement. The prosecutor breached the agreement both expressly in the terms and in the spirit. This court holds the county attorney to meticulous standards of promise and performance um, because the defendant does waive con or constitutional and fundamental rights when pleading guilty. Uh, here, the prosecutor recommended that the defendant pay court costs, and he also did not commend the sentence of concurrent sentences that was contemplated by the plea agreement. Um, so but the plea agreement was silent on court costs, so how was there a breach? So rule 2.10, I think it's two, and then rule 2.28, rule 2.82C, both require that any part of the plea agreement be on the record. And so if it is not on the record, which this, this um, record in the guilty plea does not show that there was any contemplation of him paying court costs. Well, it is not another way to look at that is that there was no agreement that the state would would um, recommend he not pay costs, or the, the agreement, the plea agreement simply didn't address costs either way. No, I think if it's not mentioned in the plea agreement, then the county attorney cannot make any sort of recommendation for the payment or non-payment. He has to remain silent under the agreement. Yeah, but it, if uh, your client had been convicted at trial, there would be court costs, right, of the same charges that he ended up pleading to, isn't that right? Subject to a reasonable ability of pay determination. Yes, I think that's right. Did he get a reasonable ability to pay determination here? He did. Um, but that doesn't, he, the, he does not have to pay court costs. And as this court has noted, and I think done a good job of recognizing that um, the payment and court debt disadvantages um, particularly communities of color and um, poverty. I think the court said that in McMurray. And so court costs has become a very um, big issue in this judicial system at this time. And because the county attorney's recommendation does carry weight, I think a, a recommendation versus an agreement of silence are two different things. Um, so I do think there's an express breach of the agreement of the terms. Did counsel object to the alleged breaches of the plea agreement? He did not, Your So Honor. in Dam A, we said that good cause is a legally sufficient reason, assuming that the new statute that prohibits the resolution of ineffective assistance of counsel claims 
passes muster, and I knew there were some challenges to that. How do we provide relief? In other words, how can there be a legally sufficient reason if we can't actually reach the merits of the issue? I think if the court does find that the ineffective assistance uh, of counsel prohibition is constitutional, then we would ask this court adopt a plain air standard of review. Um, I think the breach of a plea agreement, the case law shows that that clearly qualifies, at least under a federal test. Let me uh, take a different angle on that, because I'm, uh, why, uh, some sentencing errors, you don't have to object at sentencing in order to preserve them, right? They're, they're, they are before the court on direct appeal. For example, if the court considers an improper factor in sentencing, there's no need to object, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Why isn't a breach of the plea agreement the same kind of error? If there's a breach that occurred that's on the record and we can look at the record and figure it out, why is there a need for a contemporaneous objection? Why do we even have to treat it as ineffective assistance? Well, I don't think you do. I think that's the case law that this court has er, has taken is that we have treated it as a breach of the plea agreement and put it on the defense counsel but, to object. I, at those I don't believe so. I think the Carrillo case does talk about the similarities with an improper factor, and so I think this court could adopt that kind of standard where there is, where it is, if there is a breach, that they could then not consider whether there is a jo- an objection or not. But if there was a clear breach, just reverse. Because um. even if there was an objection, in a sense, the point of the requiring an objection is to fix the problem there. Once the prosecutor makes breaches the agreement and makes a bad recommendation, the objection is kind of too late. You sort of need to start over with a new judge, which is what we do on appeal, right? Right. I think that is the remedy. If you object, you get a new sentencing hearing in front of a new judge. So, I mean, that, that's why I'm questioning this whole framework that it has to be raised as ineffective assistance, this, this mm-hmm. notion that I'm not sure we've actually said. So where I'm driving is without adopting plain error, we could simply say that a breach of a plea agreement at sentencing on the record it, it can be raised on direct appeal without a contemporaneous objection. I do think that would fit within this court's framework of being able to raise errors on appeal, uh, errors in sentencing on appeal at at the first time on direct appeal. I think that would fit into this court's um, prior decisions. Yes. So, how would you distinguish that kind of of, of resolution of, of treating that as an improper sentencing factor? Say with uh, where would you draw that line? So we have the Granberry line of cases, right? That if if somebody doesn't object to information contained in a pre-sentence investigation report, then those errors are those challenges are waived. So let's assume we were to go in that direction and treat this as consideration of an impermissible sentencing factor. How do we square that with other kinds of sentencing error cases? I guess in that instance, I think you might look at whether or not there is prejudice um, because this court has presumed prejudice um, and in doing so presumes prejudice to protect the integrity of the judicial system. Um, I don't know if that's where you want to draw the line uh, as far as I think you would probably still... Um, even if it's an error that happens like in sentencing procedure, if there was a reason for counsel not to object, I think you could draw the line there where preserved for PCR still, um, like we do now. I think here it's very clear, and this court's case law is very clear, that there is no advantage to the defendant for the, the for no objection, and that there is an injustice when the prosecutor does breach the agreement. And so that this court has seen that as it it needs to correct that injustice. So I suppose if you have those types of errors, that's where you would draw the line as far as whether or not they could be raised on direct appeal. Would this sort of error even 
be the kind of error for which post-conviction relief would be possible? I don't think so. Um, Under the statutory grounds, I know you have some arguments logistically it's impractical because the defendant might have discharged the sentence at some point, but under the grounds for relief in the statute, would this even qualify for post-conviction relief? I still don't think so. I think it's, is, I guess I'm not sure because I think there is that catch-all, um, but I don't think that this would fit into any of those grounds under the PCR statute that explicitly, um, I suppose, I mean, you could maybe argue it's, you know, a constitutional violation if you're still going with the, it's an ineffective assistance of counsel, but I don't think that that's a good fit for this type of objection. Does the new statute apply when he pled guilty before its effective date, or it has to because he's challenging this sentencing breach that occurred on July 1 when it's now in effect? Um, our position is that the savings clause under this court's uh, reasoning in Mackey and particularly um, some of the cases it cites where it doesn't necessarily have to go, it doesn't, the, the law does not necessarily have to apply to conduct that happened before the law's effective date. But he's not challenging his guilty plea, he's challenging what happened at sentencing, the breach of the plea agreement or, uh, or reliance on improper factors, and that's July 1 when the law's on the books. That's correct. I think there's also an interesting circumstance here where we're challenging, you know, errors that happened in the plea or the, the sentencing, um, some of which are directly attributable to the prosecutor who filed a continuance to get it on the state. So I think that there is um, a, a fairness principle there, too, for Mr. Bolden specifically, um, where this court should consider his claim. And I think also in particular because none of the, the new law changes were mentioned at his um, plea, plea taking. Um, so he was not aware of these. Even at sentencing, I think the court gave him different information telling him he might not have a right, but if he does, here's how you appeal. And, and I understand like this, the court is in an interesting position as well, and district courts are doing their best job of trying to help figure out what's going to happen. And so I'm not necessarily blaming the court, but it is, it is important when we're looking at someone who's waived their constitutional rights to plead guilty um, that he be able to address uh, problems that occur when he did not waive those rights. No What's your are. best argument that the new law is unconstitutional as applied to him? I think that it's a, a violation of the separation of powers clause. But but the appeals are creatures of statute, which would involve the legislature. So how do you get around that? I think because this court, I think in giving it, in giving him the right to appeal, at least, I, I guess I'm more, I'm sorry, are you talking about in general, just filing a appeal of his guilty plea or raising an effective assistance of counsel claim? Because I think they're slightly different. Um, well, w we took this case in part to address claims that the new, the Omnibus Crime Act was unconstitutional by, by you know, requiring people to wait on, on ineffective assistance claims or limiting their ability to appeal. Um, so I just didn't want this argument to go by without having a discussion about your constitutional challenges, equal protection, due process, separation of powers. Yeah, what's, I, your, what's your best argument? I appreciate that. I think as far as the ineffective assistance of counsel piece of it, it is that this court has said that it, it has a duty to ensure that, uh, that people or individuals have the right to effective counsel. And the legislature cannot impede this court in its um, performance of constitutional duties. And so I think in doing so, and, and I think they can't remove jurisdiction of certain claims completely either. They can prescribe restrictions on this court's ability. But I think when we remove um, whole pieces of claims, we're removing um, individuals who cannot get relief and cannot for what is essentially like a constitutional violation of their right to counsel. Um, counsel, let me ask you this question. Um, uh, if if um, 
we don't hear this case now. Will a lawyer be available to assist your client in the development of an application for PCR before filing? No, I, I mean. I, so who will help? Who will help your client put together an application for PCR? I mean, I think my client will do it himself. Uh, without well, what is that? And and what does that mean? I mean, I, I think it is very dependent on what client you get, how savvy they are, what access to materials they have in the jail or the prison. Um, do you think pro se, do, are pro se people generally capable of analyzing ineffective assistance to counsel claims going through the record, uh, ordering a transcript, uh, identifying uh, key legal issues? Not in my experience, Your Honor. I think... It certainly depends on the client, but I think a lot of times, sometimes in in process in our job, clients do have an idea of what is wrong, but very often they do not. Um, when we're looking at claims very often, like when we have a discussion about potential claims, they have no idea that something happened was wrong, even if it, it is. And I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buller. May it please the court. I want to start off with where the discussion ended, and that's the constitutional claims that are presented here. The heart of those claims is really constitutional text. The Iowa Constitution sets out this court as one for the correction of errors at law under such restrictions as the General Assembly may by law prescribe. We're talking and that's different. That's different from Article Three that talks about exceptions, right? Why did the Why did the Iowa constitutional founders use a different term than is in Article 3 of the federal constitution. I think restrictions are more pointed. It gives more active power to the General Assembly. To restrict something is to affirmatively act and limit the power of the court. And that's at the heart of our constitutional bargain, right? We have unelected judges who wield tremendous power. And the bargain under our Constitution is that the judges only exercise that power as granted to them by the Constitution. And the Iowa so Constitution. The, if the legislature said uh, to, that the court shall not consider um, search and seizure claims under the Iowa Constitution, uh, is your view that that's a valid exercise of a legislative power? If the General Assembly wholly deprived this court of the power to decide a substantive claim, I think that's different than what we are talking about here. For example, if they said you can never decide any question related to search and seizure, that's problematic, but not under the correction of errors at law clause. If you look at Article 5, Section 4, there are four different buckets of authority that are given to this court. The first is appellate jurisdiction and chancery. That's the court's inherent power in an equity case. We're not talking about equity here. This is criminal law. The second bucket's correction of errors at law under restrictions provided by the General Assembly. That's where we are. That can be restricted. The third bucket is the Ritz Clause. I think there are two different interpretations of that. The way this court has generally understood that clause is it's procedural. It's for carrying out the court's judgment. It's where the procedendo power comes from. There may also be some extraordinary writs considered in there as well, certiorari, mandamus, prohibition. This court a few years ago decided a case related to whether the writ of quorum nobis was still alive in Iowa. Those may also be found within that third clause. And then the Counsel, fourth- Counsel, could the, could the legislature say um, you're entitled to an appeal, but without a lawyer? If they're talking about an appeal as a matter of right, I think they probably could say that as long as there's some mechanism by which you are able to go forward without having your right granted differently than someone else's. And what I mean by that is we couldn't say if you are, you know, defendant X, you get counsel on appeal and you're defendant Y, you can't. That is an equal protection problem. But under the due process clauses of both the state and federal constitution, there is no right to an appeal, period, full stop. Well, but let's assume uh, I, I conclude there is a, a right to an appeal, a right to a first appeal, at least. That's what Justice Brennan was suggesting in Jones. And, and, and just for the purpose of argument, assume there is a right of first appeal. Um, if there is a right of first appeal under Douglas v. California, uh, it seems to me uh, a, a person who's indigent is entitled to 
uh, council to assist them. So the legislature couldn't say, okay, um, here's your right of first appeal, um, no lawyer. I agree to an extent, but the scaffolding under your question, Your Honor, is that there would be a constitutional right to an appeal, and this court has never had held that, and the federal court has expressly held the opposite. This court yeah, has- in, dicta, in dicta, but here's the problem with saying there's no right to appeal. Um, and let's just box around this problem, maybe at 50,000 feet for starters and then zero in. But, but um, we live in a very complicated age, the, the federal... Uh, criminal code has expanded dramatically. The Iowa criminal code has expanded dramatically. Our court cases have been uh, rather complex. And then on the other hand, we now have the ability to have transcripts developed very quickly. Uh, at common law, uh, there were, uh, quote, an ability to appeal certain legal issues, um, not issues based on fact, in part because the record couldn't be developed. I mean, we, we didn't have uh, transcripts. Um, under due process, don't you think today, with uh, the ability to generate transcripts very quickly and the uh, uh, complexity of the law, the due process requires at least one look at what a trial court uh, might have done uh, somewhere, someplace? I don't think there's any authority in a controlling or majority opinion that recognizes the principles you've set forth. The defendant certainly hasn't argued for that here because there is no support for it in the law. But I would suggest the question posed there, could you completely eliminate the right to appeal, is not what we are talking about here. Well, I agree with that. I actually agree with that. I mean, the right to appeal... I mean, you're sending them over to PCR and then you could appeal the PCR to the Iowa Supreme Court. And so there is an avenue for uh, appellate appeal. And, and I get that point. Um, um, but um, to, uh, putting together an application for PCR, as, uh, uh, assuming it's an appeal as a matter of right, um, is a critical stage and you don't get a lawyer to do that. You get a lawyer afterwards. I mean. Under our PCR statute, as I read it, please correct me, I know you will if I don't have it quite right. Um, you don't have the assistance of a lawyer when the application is developed. Um, and it seems to me it's pretty hard for a, 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 a pro se indigent defendant to serve as his own liar, put together a, a get effective assistance to counsel claim, for example. Um, and so I'm worried that, that uh, the rule in this case, perhaps if we go your way, we'll, we'll have a a first right of appeal, um, but at a critical stage, uh, a lawyer won't be present. And I understand your point about the technical reading of the statute, that generally it's going to be filed by a pro se applicant before a lawyer is in is appointed in that case. But I want to talk about the practical end of what happens there in these cases. And that's that a pro se application is filed. I agree with Ms. Conroy. The level of client sophistication is obviously different in different kinds of criminal cases. But even something as basic as my lawyer did me wrong, my lawyer didn't do me a good enough job is sufficient to alert the district court that what we're talking about here is an ineffective assistance of counsel claim. The district court is then authorized to appoint counsel. And then that application will be amended. That's how it works in the real world. The legislation just doesn't, in 822, I'm talking about old legislation, Chapter 822, doesn't set up a mechanism by which you can have someone appointed before the application is filed, because that's what triggers the court's authority to hear these cases. As a general matter, there's never been a real issue with having PCR applications amended in that fashion once counsel is appointed. In fact, I think it's to everyone's benefit to have that application filed by counsel, cleaned up or made more explicit so that we all know the specific grounds that are raised. But I think but your, your explanation law, actually I, jibes with my experience on the district court that those counsel is appointed as a matter of course uh, whenever and I missed the first part of your question your, honor. I'm sorry. your explanation comports with kind of my experience but I, I want to go back to an issue uh, a little bit related to what you've been talking about with Justice Apple which is what role if anything does discretionary review here play as a potential fail-safe for you know kind of the one-off case or the oddball case where the court uh, believes that a case needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. 
And I want to answer a little bit broader than just discretionary review because I don't think that's the only tool we're talking about. Discretionary review of this court's non-appeal ways to review a case is maybe one of the more narrow ones. It's defined by statute in 814.6. There's specific grounds. There's what has sometimes been called a catch-all for issues that are of importance to the bench and bar. I think that's a real mushy concept to try and apply. But to the point, I think, at the heart of your question, there are a lot of different ways that issues can be brought before this court. All 814.6 and 814.7 regulate is the taking of appeals as a matter of right. They don't say that a defendant cannot seek discretionary review. In some cases, that will be appropriate. For example, SF 589 amended 814.6 to allow discretionary review from motion and arrest of judgment following a guilty plea, and that that issue can be raised through ADR rather than any other means. The court also frequently reviews sentencing errors by means of a petition for writ of certiorari. Again, there are some limitations on that mo mode of review. For example, in Sorcy, this court said that those errors also need to be preserved, that those need to be raised for the first time in the district court. There's a little bit of tension there in what this court said in props, where the court recognized that a motion to correct an illegal sentence can also be reviewed by certiorari. But at the end of the day, I think what my point there is, is that there are a lot of different ways cases get in front of this court. All we're talking about here is the taking of an appeal as a matter of right. Could I um, follow up on that subject I was exploring with Ms. Conroy, which is, you know, do we even need to reach the constitutional challenge? Because I, at least to me personally, I, I'm having trouble understanding why a breach of the plea agreement on the record has to be treated as ineffective assistance of counsel. Why can't we say simply that you don't need to make a contemporaneous objection, you can appeal it on direct appeal, like certain other sentencing errors? I think that's an interesting argument, Your Honor, but it's certainly not the argument that the defense has made in the briefing or well, in oral arguments Well, it's kind today. of analogous to the plain error argument. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I think it is a step off of plain error, and I want to talk briefly about why. When we talk about breach of the plea agreement, I think we often think of a true breach. And this is the circumstance, like in a big office, where a different prosecutor is covering for someone. They didn't know that the deal was to recommend probation instead of prison. So the wrong prosecutor shows up, recommends prison instead of probation. That's a clear breach of the plea agreement. But that is not what we're talking about here. Here, the state did exactly what the state promised. The state went and recommended concurrent sentences exactly as the state promised in the plea agreement. What we're arguing about is that the defense wants this court to get inside the head of the prosecutor and say, well, yeah, they said the words, but I don't think they said no, them hard I enough. I don't think that's really the issue. I think uh, whether the, we consider the matter on PCR or on direct appeal, we're going to look at the whole transcript of the sentencing and decide after reading the whole transcript whether the prosecutor in letter and in spirit complied with the agreement. What's in the prosecutor's head is kind of irrelevant, isn't it? I don't agree, Your Honor, because here the transcript on its own is not going to answer the question that the defendant wants this court to decide, which is whether the state undermined the spirit of the agreement. Everything the state said was compliant with the agreement. What the defense... Well, how, how would the analysis be different if the lawyer had objected and we were reviewing this under an ineffective assistance framework? It seems... To me, the discussion you're having is about the merits, and I think what Justice Mansfield is asking is, in terms of a legal framework to evaluate it, it seems to me the work is the same. Like, we're looking at the transcript, and we look at the letter and spirit of the agreement, and that's it. And I don't think it is the same, because while, br while prejudice is presumed in this analysis, breach is not. I suspect if you ask the defense lawyer here, why didn't you object? The answer is going to be because the state said what they promised to say. That is relevant for the court to consider. And that's why claims like this, like so many other PCR claims, should be heard, or so many other ineffective assistance claims, should be heard in post-conviction relief. This court has said again and again that ordinarily the record is not sufficient to decide these types of claims. This is one of the claims that isn't sufficient. Can you explain that one more time? So... If counsel had objected at the time of the alleged breach, on review, our review would consist of looking at the transcript and seeing if the agreement was or was not complied with. We don't need to get into subjective motivations, et cetera. If we looked at it and said a breach under the same standard we would have used is akin to an improper sentencing factor, 
How does the method by which we evaluate that claim change? And I'm not sure it does if there's an objection. If the error is preserved, we're not talking about the stuff that we're talking about here. The reason the distinctions matter is because this is raised as an ineffective assistance claim. And I don't know if that actually addresses your question here. I feel like we may be talking past each other a little bit. But my concern with these types of claims being raised on direct appeal is the same one that this court has articulated time and time again. Frequently, there are questions that we just don't know the answer to from the record. This court's case law has suggested we look at the spirit of the plea agreement. So part of what we look at is whether the prosecutor vigorously enough recommended what they said they would recommend. It's hard to decide that looking at a cold record like this one. The prosecutor absolutely said what the prosecutor promised he would say. He recommended those concurrent sentences. The defense's argument is that, yeah, look beyond the black and white text, find that these other things really secretly undermined what can, the point of the agreement Can you agreement think of was. a case on an ineffective assistance claim raising a, a breach of a plea agreement where in the past this court or the court of appeals has preserved the claim for further record development? No, I don't think it's happened, in part because this kind of claim is different from what we normally see. Like I mentioned earlier, we often have the clear-cut ones. You know, you were supposed to recommend probation, you recommend prison instead. Nobody's going to fight about what the intent of the agreement was there. The tricky ones are like this case, where reading the cold record, you don't get a clear answer. And I think that's why the legislature acted rationally, following this court's lead when the court has said time and time again that ordinarily these cases need to be decided in post conviction conviction relief. It's part of our gradual transition from you could raise these, from you must raise these claims before 2004 to you can raise these claims after 2004 to now these claims must be raised in post-conviction relief. The legislature's followed this I have this a question court. about that. The time is up, but I'm, I still want to ask you, and it's on that very topic. Um, D Justice Waterman asked a question a little bit ago. I'd like to hear it about it from the state's perspective. Guilty plea was before July 1. Sentencing was after um, what about, help me understand and get beyond the fact that the state is the reason sentencing happened after that deadline. Well, we have no reason to think there's any kind of nefarious purpose here. This court in Dami, Mackey, Drain, and Train has said repeatedly that the relevant event for purposes of determining the applicability of SF-589 is the date that judgment was entered. Judgment was entered here on July 1 and those cases control. I'd ask this court to affirm and find that SF 589 passes constitutional muster. Thank you, Mr. Buller. Ms. Conroy? I wanted to start, I think, by addressing Justice McDonald's question. I don't think that there is a case that preserves um, a breach of a plea agreement. I think if we would have had that case, it would have been Mackey. Um, and that is because of the rules we have, Rule 2.10 and Rule 2.82c, which require that the guilty plea be in the record at the time the plea is entered. And so I think this court has addressed that if there is something that is not in the record at the guilty plea proceeding, then they, I think it's State v. Loyal, or Loy, Loyal, uh, then that they assume that is not part of the record or that is not part of the plea because the prosecutor is aware of the rules. So I don't think that this is a case, this isn't the normal ineffective assistance of counsel case that where we need a further record and that is why this court should address it. And I, I understand like the point that we raised plain air. I do think addressing it as a sentencing error is addressing it as plain error, whether I guess you call it that or not, but I think it's consistent with this court's um, addressing sentencing errors for the first time on appeal in the absence of objection. But I also think the breach of a plea agreement fits in with that plain error um, uh, concept of that the error is obvious, um, it's plain, it affects a substantial right of the defendant, and that it also affects the fairness of the proceedings and the judicial um, system as a whole. And so I do think that address, addressing these types of errors and giving defendants a remedy for a breach of their constitutional right of 
effective assistance of counsel is necessary in these types of cases. And I don't think that preserving them for PCR is appropriate under the circumstances or that it is an effective um, way to preserve uh, these criminal defendants' rights at sentencing. Well, why can't you why can't you file two actions? I mean, if you have in a case where you have a direct appeal, you file your direct appeal um, and simultaneously file a PCR um, with a guilty plea or um, yeah. well, let's let's use the ineffective assistance as a, as a better example. Supposing you have some some issues that can go up on direct appeal that are aren't um, ineffective assistance, but then you got some other issues that are. Why can't you file uh, two actions? Well, I, th I think you might be able to. Um, I think I've seen um, in a limited experience that the court will not hear a PCR until the direct appeal is done. Um, but also, I think that's directly at, at odds with the statute then, and, or the, the purpose of the statute, which is uh, essentially to eliminate waste um, and frivolous appear appeals and it, it's this court has said that preserving an effective assistance of claims on um, <clears throat> direct appeal that can be decided is a waste of judicial time and resources and that that um, reasoning applies directly to the situation where you would be filing two different claims having two different lawyers presumably um, argue these claims and possibly then appealing another PCR ruling. And so we're just creating more litigation, which is directly contravenes the purpose of this litigation. Um. <clears throat> Do the other avenues that are available for a defendant to seek relief in this court or the Court of Appeals uh, alleviate any constitutional concerns with eliminating the appeal as a matter of right? I don't believe so. Um, because we are talking about a different kind of process, um, a single judge, I guess I'm not familiar quite with discretionary review. I assume you get counsel for that, but I do not know um, because our office doesn't frankly handle them. Um, but I think, especially with the discretionary element to it, I don't think that that alleviates the concerns that your constitutional rights are going to be effectuated enough. Um, so I don't think just discretionary review or some other avenue is, is an appropriate Does way. the good cause language alleviate any concerns or challenges that you would have on a constitutional basis to restricting the right to direct appeal? Well, I think, quite frankly, I don't know that you need to address the, the sentencing, or excuse me, the this constitutionality of the right to file an appeal because I think you are able to hear the appeal through the good cause um, exception because he's not raising um, challenges to his guilty plea. And so I, I guess it's, it's obviously up to this court, but I, I don't think that you need to address that constitutionality provision because he is able to get a, a right of a direct appeal, if that makes sense. Um, at least in this case, but obviously this case is just this case. And, and, and there's uh, several others I'm sure that you guys are hearing where that um, they might not fit into good cause. And, and that's hard for me to answer too, because we don't exact, I mean, we have an idea from Dami and Henderson what good cause may be, but we don't know the, the whole extent of it or what it might end up. So. You may wrap up. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for these reasons, we ask that Mr. Bolden, his sentences be vacated and then it get remanded for resentencing before a different judge. Thank you. The case of State versus Bolden is hereby submitted and we will take a quick uh, five minutes to get the tables ready for the next case. <laughs>